guitar, jamming good with weird and giving, and the spiders from Mars. He played it left hand, but made it too far. Became the special man, and we were Ziggy's band. Hello and welcome to Wars Radio 2. I'm your host, James Robert Cruz Wilder, and I'm here with a very special guest today, Sean E. Williams. Say hello, Sean. Hi, James. <laughs> All right. Uh, Sean is the author of Wars, The Battle of Phobos, Gonjin 1, The Great Journey. He's also the author of the upcoming Gonjin 3. Now, before we get into Wars, Sean, uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, what kind of work you've done in the past, and just a little bit about yourself. Yeah, um, uh, right now uh, I'm taking part in this uh, Clockwork Storybook 30-Day Writing Challenge that uh, you might have read about over at Major Spoilers. Uh, I'm taking part as a guest writer, and uh, uh, in addition to that, I'm also writing the third arc of uh, Ferris, the new spin-off comic uh, from Fables, which is getting published by Vertigo. Oh, yeah. Wow. that's I've read Fables before pretty cool yeah no it's huh. it's really exciting yeah excellent all right so how did you then you end up getting involved in wars uh wars actually um goes back uh quite a few years um the the card game came out in 2004 and uh, i was a big fan of decipher at that point already uh i grew up playing uh, star trek and star wars and lord of the rings and uh then when they lost the, I don't know how much your listeners know, I'm assuming since this is the Wars podcast quite a bit, but um, when they lost the, the Star Wars license and uh, launched Wars, uh, you know, they, they did such a great job of creating a full universe uh, with, you know, Michael Stackpole's stories and all the other short stories they had uh, that they published and as well as the music and uh you know, just to kind of fill out the, the universe that they created with the card game. And I was a big fan of it, and uh, a couple of years after it came out, and, you know, Decipher was having financial trouble, um, I ended up reaching out to them, actually, to, I was working in Hollywood at the time, uh, I reached out to them to do Wars as an animated series, and they were kind enough to actually, you know, give me the green light to, to develop it and shop it around. So, uh, anything come from the uh, animated series trial there? Um, you know, I had a lot of good meetings about it, and, uh, you know, ultimately it's one of those things where, because uh, I was pitching it as an anime series, since it has more of an adult tone than uh, the kid series, and there, there are very few places in Hollywood that are interested in making anime series right now. But, uh, but while I was doing that, Guerrero Quest Books approached the cipher about doing uh, prose, books as well as comics, and, uh, you know, since I didn't have, um, since this effort and I hadn't talked about uh, that whole side of, of developing it, um, you know, we, uh, you know, got excited about Girl Quest books coming on board, you know, and, and running with it as well, and, you know, I got introduced to Josh uh, Radke actually through Decipher, and it was one of those things where it's like, hey, you know, I love playing in this universe, too. Why don't we all work together on this? Sweet. Uh, yeah, it's really exciting, first of all, for me to hear that you were a fan of all of this um, before the book series came out. I've talked to Nathan Patrick Butler, and I uh, met Jim Perry in person, and, you know, they were uh, both brought on by Josh Radke uh, without really knowing anything about the universe ahead of time. Oh, okay. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> it's good to meet another old schooler. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's one of those things, too, where um, the one of the interesting challenges with doing um, the first uh, uh, the first book and, and then also the third one was trying to integrate the, the story that I had come up with for the animated series, um, which I kind of explored as well uh, through this comic book series that we're actually doing through Grail Quest Books um, that takes place after the Battle of Phobos uh, and before, during, and after the Rift opens. So it's 
uh, you know, trying to integrate basically two different mythologies into a third uh, has definitely been uh, a challenge. I can believe that. So uh, your first novella, The, um, the Great Journey, uh, mm -hmm. I was really impressed by it when I first read it. Uh, obviously, you know, I've been a fan of wars for a long time, and I was really excited when the new novellas came out, but I was expecting, actually, for them to kind of have that uh, middling quality of some uh, an old property being returned. Uh, but I, I really wasn't expecting to have this book where it cuts back and forward, back in time between the past and the future of this science fiction universe, uh, covering the entire span of this the uh, Hidgen family. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how you came up with that novella's plot line? Um, yeah, uh, you know, it, it kind of came about in two different ways. Um, the first off, I knew I wanted to tell a Ganjin story, uh, again, just to tie in with, um, the stuff I had come up with for the animated series and then also, um, for the comic book. And it, I, I find it the most interesting of the, of the cultures that they came up with with wars because the Mavericks always felt a little bit too, uh, Firefly for me, or anything you did with the Mavericks, at least, would be compared to Firefly, and, and uh, you know, the, there's no point in competing, so, <laughs> um, you know, at least for me, so, um, so I wanted to stay away from them, and then, uh, you know, the Earther culture uh, was just so foreign to me at the time, as far as the whole corporate, being driven by corporate interests and all this stuff, and, you know, since, you know, a lot's changed in our world uh, since wars first came out what, eight years ago now? <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, uh, so yeah, so, and the, since all this is before the rift opens, you know, they pretty much left Ganjin, um, which was what I was interested in to begin with. Um, so, coming up with a story that was interesting enough to take place uh, before the Battle of Phobos uh, was a challenge, for sure. And then, but then I was, as I was going back over the card lore that the Cypher had already created and going back through the short stories, uh, one thing that kept popping out of me was this reference to the Great Journey. Um, and then on um, Higan or uh card, it also mentions that he's the descendant of the guy who wrote it, I think, if I'm remembering my cards correctly. But he exists as a card, at least. And, and so I kind of put two and two together. It's like, well, why don't, you know, we haven't seen his story at all, so why don't we, why don't we do that and kind of, you know, get the, the two related somehow. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think it worked out. I think it did, too. <laughs> One thing that I really loved about your novella was how Gonjin your novella felt. Um, mm -hmm. the, the way that it it really did kind of encapsulate their culture in the way that it had this, uh, you know, like being about a family in different time periods that you focused on, um, which I, you know, I was uh, nerdily, uh, <laughs> I recognized the uh, name from the cards, as you'd mentioned before, but um, that you managed to tie it in so well with how their culture was. Did you think about that when you were writing it? Oh, yeah, no, absolutely, and I, I don't think I could have done it if I hadn't already spent uh, a number of years just, like, living in that universe. Um, the the Gondrian culture is so specific uh, and so well flushed out in the card game that, uh, you know, to try and, and just, you know, make it up on the fly and not be totally contradictory I think would be impossible. So, uh, you know, yeah, just the fact that I'd, basically lived there in my head for a number of years, uh, you know, with the comic book and the animated series made it a lot easier. Uh, there were a lot of specifics I didn't have to look up just to kind of, you know, be able to nail those specifics down. But, uh, you know, as far as the, the feel goes, uh, it was a lot easier than the more contemporary stuff. Um, simply because the, the stuff with um, Higan Shijin, uh, his whole arc, is near future enough that I was trying to, uh, you know, be realistic to today's world, but at the same time, you know, being, you know, s still in that sci-fi realm that, uh, 
you know, feels like it fits in the same Wars universe. So I think that was actually the biggest challenge for me. So uh, do you have a favorite part of the novella as a whole? Uh, I do, actually. Um, uh, and uh, it, it was a moment that totally surprised me because I wasn't expecting it at all. And uh, it's the it's the bit when uh, Higanor Chito is uh, looking for, he's looking for, um, I think, the source of the the um the drain on resources uh and i want to say it's about halfway through uh i wrote i wrote it almost two years ago at this point so i'm sorry if i'm being vague or incorrect but um he's flying through this canyon and uh all of a sudden he has this this sense memory that uh you know he's been down this canyon before and he can't quite place it and then he realizes that uh, it was a canyon that he, he grew up flying through as a kid, and he ends up finding this little cave that, you know, he used to play hide-and-seek in. And uh, for me, I had no idea that that was coming. Uh, and it was, it was one of those magical moments in writing where the, uh, the character takes you someplace that uh, you don't expect to, or at the same time, um, you know, he has this character history that, I hadn't even like created it just kind of, you know, happened. It was, it was a very surreal moment. Uh, but I think it's definitely, definitely my favorite moment in the book. I love that moment. Um, yeah. So I loved how you had moments like that where the characters in your novella were allowed to just be really human. Um, it was moments like that where it stopped feeling like it was science fiction that, the moments where they were at home and just being a family or uh, another moment I really liked where uh, uh, Hijin Shijin gets drunk with a bunch of Russians after he's been working on a power plant with them. And, yeah. <laughs> and the scene just plays so naturally um, that it when you're reading it, you just can't help thinking, wow, you know, this could be a real place and these real people. Yeah. And, uh, again, that, that moment, like I knew he needed to go to Russia to, to help set up, uh, the plant up there. Um, but other than that, like all the, all the interaction stuff, it was, it just came about naturally, like you said, and it's, uh, you know, I don't know where, where it came from, but it was just at, at that point in the novel, uh, you know, I'd spent enough time with him that, uh, you know, the way he was acting and uh, emotionally where he was at in that, in that moment in the story, uh, you know, it, it, he was just doing his own thing and, and, you know, the Russians were there and it was, it was a moment that I felt like he could kind of be himself. You know, he was away from work, he was away from his wife uh, and, uh, you know, that, that bit where he stumbles out into the into the snow and is just looking at the stars. It's just like, you know, that's sci-fi to me. That's, you know, that's the realm we live in where it's, we're just, we're just all there dreaming of, of the things that can uh, potentially happen in the future. So. So how was it working on this novella when you, you're working in an era which is set before where they came up, you know, with where they thought was the most interesting point. Everything else was just backstory. And here you are yeah. writing in a part that's backstory. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it was it's it's simultaneously challenging and uh, and also uh, exciting, um, you know, for for multiple reasons. Uh, you know, it for one thing, it's hard. The hard part it comes in in trying to, you know, match up with what a what they already have established for the backstory being. Um, especially with this third novella, um, it's, we're really getting into, uh, the pre-existing material. So, you know, making sure the continuity is accurate to both the card game and the role-playing game, um, has been, has been a, a, a fun challenge. And, uh, but it's also exciting because for me personally as a writer, um, and for me personally as a fan, um, I enjoy these properties that have the world building aspect and, and these deep, rich mythologies. Um, so yeah, so like for me, uh, I'm a big fan of J.R.R. Tolkien's, uh, stuff with Lord of the Rings, uh, not only for 
the Lord of the Rings books themselves, but also for the Silmarillion and all the stuff he did that, that never made it, uh, you know, that into the actual story itself, because it's all backstory and mythology. And I mean, the fact that the fact that he created an entire mythology for this book series is just mind blowing to me. And I, I really get excited about that type of world building. So Decipher, to be able to play in uh, Decipher's sandbox uh, with Wars has just been a real treat. Huh. I can believe that. Uh, just with the group I've been playing with on the RPG, we've had plenty of fun exploring the uh, many areas of, you know, there's a vast amount of stuff to work with. It must be really fun just to write in. Oh, yeah, no, it really is. And the, I really enjoy the, the research side of things and just being able to, you know, to, to delve into the card lore that is just, uh, you know, you think it's a throwaway thing because it's just on a card that, you know, you play in a game, but then to be able to, to take one line or one name and to expand it into a full character or story arc has just been, it's, it's great. I love it. Yeah. So actually, yeah. Oh, um, I was just going to say, actually, um, for me, you were talking about playing the role playing game. Uh, uh, in my own experience, uh, to, or just to tie it in, kind of the uh, when I was reading the Silmarillion uh, right after the the Lord of the Rings role playing game came out, uh, the Decipher put out the uh, I was rereading Silmarillion and there's this this again a throwaway bit about one of the uh, one of the Silmarils gets lost in a shipwreck up in the north in the frozen you know wasteland and. Uh, uh, I'm like, oh my god, this would be amazing! Like, what happened to this? And you know, what if somebody finds it and this, that, and the other? So, you know, I came up with this whole campaign just elaborating on that because, yeah, it's that kind of that kind of mining of uh, of stories and material is just it's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is actually kind of a treat for me because I haven't actually gotten to talk uh, by voice to someone else who was a fan of Wars back when. It, you know, was first out in 2004, 2005, ever. Mm -hmm. uh, I, was, <laughs> I, I was the only person in my town who uh, knew what it was, downloading the short stories every week until the uh, site closed down, pretty much. So, um, what, did you have a favorite short story from back in the day? Oh, Lord. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I don't, I mean... I had a couple, but it's been so long since I read them um, that I can't, uh, you know, I can't really nail it down. I did like how uh, Michael Stackpole uh, was able to kind of have this ongoing uh, arc with his characters uh, and his short stories that, you know, because the way Decipher released it, if I'm remembering correctly, uh, was they did like a story a week or something like that. Uh, to kind of tease the property, and so, am, am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, it's been so long. It, it wasn't. Oh god, it's been a long time for me too. It, it wasn't always a, every week, but it was pretty close. There were twenty three short stories in total. So yeah, but they doled them out over time, and uh, and uh, yeah, the the fact that Michael Stackpole's characters, uh, you know, weren't all at once, uh, at least to my recollection. Um, was really great just to kind of see them evolve and their their story evolve over over the course of time. I'm a big fan of, of serialized storytelling too, uh, which is why these novellas are so great uh, for one. Uh, and and so yeah, it's it's kind of nice to be part of that serialized wars storytelling tradition, I guess. <laughs> yes, uh, and uh, Stackpole stories the um. The main characters of them, Kajiko Tarako and uh, Starhawk Murren, I think one of the big disappointments was that uh, their storyline didn't really ever end since uh, yeah. it was ongoing. Yeah, and that was one of the things, too, where, um, you know, both with the with the animated series that I was shopping around and then also, too, with, um, uh, with these novellas, I think it was one of those things where... Uh, Nobody wanted to touch them just because, you know, they're kind of established enough already and done so well that uh, it'd be hard to, it'd be hard to, you know, do them justice, I think. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> I actually had a uh, a kind of a geek out moment at uh, World Fantasy Con uh, this fall because Michael Sackpole was there, and I actually got to got to say hi and and that I was working on this. And uh, I don't think he'd gotten a chance to read the novellas, uh, but uh, you know it was it was still kind of fun to to meet the guy. That, you know, had a large part to do with his creation and to be able to play in his universe. Oh wow! Yeah, how was uh how was meeting Mr. Sackpole? It, it was uh, it was one of those things where it was just in passing. Like I was I was with some writers that I knew, and then he was with some people he knew, and I, I you know recognized him uh, by his name tag, and you know just introduced myself, and uh, you know he was very cordial about the whole thing. So it was kind of nice. Yeah. yeah, that definitely would be. <laughs> um, of course, Michael Stackpole. Uh, Cypher was familiar with him beforehand because he uh, helped them when they made uh, the expanded universe set of Star Wars cards with his um, X-Wing characters that they uh, took some pictures of. Oh, uh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. That makes sense, then. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, there's a... Every once in a while you hear someone who's a fan of Wars wonder if there's, like, a another Taraco Starhawk story shoved off in a drawer somewhere. If there is, I haven't seen it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, It'd be great if there was, though. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And, well, you know, it's really great just to have more stories here. Um, There was so re- little to go on in the past with Wars. Uh, You know, there were 23 short stories, but... uh. You know, you can only get so much in one of those, and now that we have the novellas, which are a lot longer, there's a lot more depth that can be put into any person who shows up. Yeah, and the uh, what surprised me too was the uh, the amount of material that was done for the role playing games. Um, they uh, there was a lot of there's a lot of specifics in there that that I wasn't even aware of uh, you know when I started working on this project uh, so it, it's been fun to kind of explore those a little bit too. Mm-hmm. So I uh, there's no way I could get away here without uh, asking you a little bit about your next novella that you're going to be working on, Gonjin Three. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, obviously, we're still on the uh, set the second set of Wars novellas. Uh, which the first Gonjin one by Sabrina Freed has fried, I'm still not sure how to pronounce her name, <laughs> um, has been released. But uh, And we're going to have Nathan Butler soon, and after that, Jim Perry's. Um, but is there anything you can tell us about uh, the In the Future coming book? Um, I, I haven't actually talked to Josh about what I can and can't talk about with it. Uh, I, I think, uh, and also too, it hasn't been approved. The, the final, uh, proposal hasn't been approved by Decipher yet. So I don't even know if what I have proposed is going to be, uh, approved, but, uh, I, I can pretty confidently say that there will be no bots involved (laughs) just judging by the timeline. So, uh, (laughs) And that uh, Higan or Cheetah will be uh, will be in it again as well. But beyond that, uh, we'll see. Well, I'm pretty sure at your mention of no bots, there is someone listening out there who just squealed. So, <laughs> it, I, 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 when I got the um, uh, the go ahead to to start thinking about the third novella, uh, and I realized that that no bots would kind of have to be a part of it. I, I did a little bit of squealing myself. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, they're part of the universe that I think has always been kind of under, uh, underseen again, just because they, you know, the majority of their, uh, existence took place before the card game and before the rift opened. So, uh, you know, they're almost, uh, I don't want to say archaic because they're not that far gone, but they're they're just kind of accepted as existing in the in the Wars universe uh, when the game starts. So so to be able to to explore what it's like when they first show up, uh, I'm really looking forward to doing that. Okay, on a uh, 
on a more down note here, I don't. Uh, -oh. uh <laughs> the uh, the first Gonjin novella deals with something that happens in the backstory of Wars, which got really scarily uh, paralleled in real life. Uh, a nuclear meltdown in Asia. Of course, it's much, much more huge in uh, the novella than what happened in Japan, you know, thank goodness. But um, how, how was that? It was really spooky reading the book because uh, it seemed so possible after that. Yeah, it was, um, it was one of those things. I mean, I wrote the first draft of the novella a year before um, the, the actual meltdown happened in the, in the tsunami. And, uh, you know, we were still, um, it had been approved at that point, but I think we were still editing it or no, it was, it was about to get published. I'm trying to remember the timeline exactly, but it was, you know, we were, we had a solid draft of it and um, I want to say it was about to get published. And, uh, you know, both Josh and myself and uh, Warren Holland and uh, Cindy Thornburg over at Decipher and, and uh, we all we all kind of were on the same page that, you know, we have to we have to say something because if we put this out as is uh, without some type of note, uh, you know, it just wouldn't be right because at that point, you know, people had died and uh, we weren't sure how long the meltdown was going to go for at that point, you know, it hadn't been contained. So it was definitely, you know, it was scary for, for, uh, the world. Uh, and it was, you know, scary for us just because, you know, in the book we had explored worst case scenario, uh, you know, to the extreme, uh, which as you said, you know, was backstory in the card game, which had been established, you know, back in 2004. So, so to see it play out was definitely, uh, definitely a scary moment for, for everyone, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, it was spine chilling just <laughs> hearing about it. But um, it, it, it does bring up a one thing that science fiction can do that other genres often can't, which is reflect on something in the real world in a way that lets us deal with it in ways that you really can't in reality because it often is just so you know it's so awful to think about you know people really dying from radiation poisoning but when you have a reflection of it in science fiction that it allows you to deal with it on a plane that's a little more easy to comprehend oh yeah no absolutely and it was uh... i actually found it kind of reassuring um just the way uh, that the story in Wars had been developed, uh, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, these people took such a horrific tragedy and, uh, and you know, instead of, you know, just giving up, you know, to be able to turn it around and, and start an entire new civilization, you know, out of that rubble, uh, you know, I definitely find that inspiring. And uh, so there's, there's stuff we can learn in science fiction that reality is a lot more real sometimes I think than uh, than it could be necessarily but obviously we're all glad that things weren't worse than they were <laughs> indeed alright so another uh, major tonal shift here um, we've got a few listener questions here for you uh, we have one here from uh, Jordan Stout he asks, are there any plans to do anything with Pallas, the Gonjin asteroid base with its own space-based Nobot? Um, do, you, do you know which Nobot that is, actually, now that I think about it? Uh, because there's one, I know that there's one Nobot that uh, doesn't show up until after the Battle of Phobos, and my guess is that it's the one that's on Pallas, uh, in which case uh, I would have the firm answer of no, just because, uh, you know, with the third novella, we're uh, only getting into the Battle of Phobos, so we're not actually going to see anything that takes place after that, I can say, I think. 
Uh, yeah, it's uh, it was a Nobot that was built specifically for Pallas Base after the Battle of Phobos. Okay. I've Do you have been... a name on it? Like, because now I'm darking out and, and I want to <laughs> look and see if it's the one that we're not using. Oh, uh, because I remember there being one. Yeah, it's. God, I think it's the the one that was going to appear. God, now now I'm going to sound really dorky here. Uh, I think it was the one that was going to appear in the edge of a sword set. Yeah, is it uh, is it Yakan? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's there's one. Um, I've not heard of Yakan. Um, there is uh, one called Hanya. Yeah. Hanya. Hanya. Um, the serpent demon one, and uh, Hanya will not be making it into Gondon Three. I can safely say so. So yeah, with that being the case. Uh, the, the Nobot on Palace will not be making it as well. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, all right, and we we have another reader question here from Walker okay. Roberts. Um, she asks, when were you first interested in wars? Uh, I, uh, yeah, like, like I mentioned earlier, um, I was a... Uh, I was a big fan of all of the Cypher's games, uh, going back to Star Trek Next Generation. And so when they lost the license to Star Wars and, you know, developed their own uh, uh, universe for the for the Wars card game, I, A, I was a big fan of the, the Star Wars mechanic, but then B, um, you know, I was, I'm a big fan of these uh, large mythology storytelling uh games so so to be able to to play in that and the way it was brilliant the way they teased the short stories and um i want to say they had the soundtrack available on the website too that you could download um at the time and is they did such a great job of creating that universe uh before the game even launched just to get you excited that um you know when it finally came out it was uh it was a real joy all right and finally, we have a question here from Dave Kuhn. He asks, mm -hmm. can Shocho glitch? <laughs> um, I, I would say, uh, for me, as far as my um, the way I think of uh, Shocho, uh, I would say no. Just because uh, Wars takes place 300 years in the future. And at the rate that uh, computer technology is developing nowadays uh, to realistically think of something a, a computer as powerful as as Shocho glitching uh, is just kind of beyond the realm of realism I think and that's that's actually one thing I really uh, appreciate about what how the cipher handles wars uh, you know from from the very get go and I have I have some of the original uh, game design documents and stuff that they came up with for it uh, that the cyber was kind enough to give me when I was developing an animated property and, and right out of the gate you know they were all about realism and uh, even though it, it was a card game and and a series of short stories they were very much uh, wanting to make sure that you know look this is you know space travel has to be based in realism and all the concepts grab drive um, you know the moon and rift like all of it is based on some level of science and so you know, the fact that you can't just, you know, teleport uh, from one place to another uh, and be there instantly or, you know, with the warp drives, like grab drive takes time to get from one place to another. So uh, with these stories, they've been really good about, you know, keeping us real as far as all that technology goes and, and you know, not being able to instantly do anything. Um, so I really appreciated that. And, uh, you know, in, in the first book, we kind of explored... Uh, the mechanics of Shoto a little bit with the uh, attempted infiltration with a computer virus and, and how Shoto is able, able to easily squash it. Uh, and I kind of feel like the glitch goes along with that, where it's, there's so many fail-safes built into the program itself, and the program's so massive that anytime something like that, uh, if it did happen, like there'd be so many redundancies in place that there, there'd really be no way for it to make a mistake that was of any significance, if at all. All right. 
Now, that works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that works. Now, I, I wanted to ask you about working with the other authors. Uh, I, yeah. Just from talking uh, to Jim Perry and uh, Nathan Patrick Butler already, that you three collaborated a bit more than, you know, is usual for authors to do on these sorts of things. Um, can you tell us a little about that process? Yeah, um, there was a lot of, um, when we were initially writing the proposals and, um, you know, coming up with the first, uh, not only the first, the first novella, but then also kind of a through line for all three, for each of the three factions. Um, cause at that point early on, we're like, okay, you know, ballpark, like what, you know, where's this going? Um, that kind of thing. Like for me, uh, you know, I, I flushed out the, the first arc fully. And then the second arc was left pretty much up to Sabrina. Uh, but then the third arc I knew had to be about Nobots just because that's what happened. And so, uh, I mean, I, I was really fortunate to, um, have Sabrina do the second book in that she did a great job of, of, you know, lining things up for me with the third one and having it, you know, having things be in place for me to, to, to get to where I needed to be, um, in order to finish out the story. And, you know, with, with Nathan and Jim, um, it was very much, uh, you know, a back and forth, uh, specifically with our first, with our first novellas too, just to make sure that, you know, this character is going to be in this novella. Can he be over here too? Or like, okay, if he is going to be over there, you know, realistically, again, getting back to the realism, like, can he get there in time using, you know, grab drive or whatever. Um, so it was, it was a little bit of a challenge, but it was a lot of fun. I was able uh, to basically be isolated with Ganjin, you know, being in the political state that it was. Uh, whereas, you know, I think there was a little bit more interplay between the Earthers and the Mavericks with the first one than they had with the Ganjins. Yeah. Yeah, so um, have you had any contact then with uh, elements of the Wars fandom that's uh, around nowadays? Obviously, where it's, uh, it's a smaller fandom, <laughs> still growing, but have you had the opportunity to uh, meet anybody? Uh, I haven't really... Um... You know, which I, I'm, I'm still, uh, I'm still looking uh, <laughs> in a way. Uh, but Wars was around for such a brief period of time that I kind of feel like uh, it, it would have been very hard for, uh, for people to get a hold of it um, while it was on the shelves. Uh, you know, it was around for a lot less time than I thought it was, just because. Uh, you know, since I was into it, I had this perception that, oh, well, obviously, you know, everyone is that kind of thing. Um, and I grew up in Montana, and so, you know, I was isolated to begin with up there, you know, and it was my brother and I were, you know, almost the only two people we knew playing, you know, Star Trek and Star Wars and Lord of the Rings. So, uh, you know, so for us, we were the extent of the fandom to begin with. So, uh, you know, to hear that other people even know about wars is, is just exciting for me. Yeah, it's um, it's definitely been exciting uh, for me too, just as a fan. Um, most people who've uh, gotten into wars have gotten into it just lately with the uh, novellas, or oddly from buying the cards on the internet, since you can uh, get a whole box of the decks for about ten dollars now. Uh, well, and that's I mean that's actually the great thing, uh, and one of the reasons why I was so passionate about. Uh, you know, doing the animated series and the comic book series and, and now the novellas um, was, uh, you know, just trying to, you know, reestablish that that awareness and, and fandom because it is a, an incredible property that, that the Cypher put together and it's, it's a real, it's got something for everybody which uh, is just really hard to communicate because when you say it's a sci-fi property that's got something for everybody, um, I mean, but there really is, like, a little bit of Star Wars, there's a little bit of Firefly, there's a little bit of Battlestar, like, um, you know, for me, you know, the Gonj inside really, you know, it, there's there's a little bit of Cowboy Bebop, you know, a, a little bit of um, Samurai Champloo, like, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's so every, it's so all over the place that, 
you can find something you like and latch onto it and have a full experience and not feel like you're missing out on anything. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, the factionalism of wars is. It seems like it would be a difficult thing at first because you have these whole uh, groups within the universe that are so culturally different, but it really adds to the realism at one point. But second of all, when you're, you know, I've been talking to lots of people trying to get them into wars just here at my college, <laughs> and mm -hmm. one thing that's really been, you know, great is that for myself, Gonjin is uh, my favorite culture. <laughs> but, oh, great. But uh, other people, you know, you can find people who any other of the cultures is going to appeal to them. You can find people who really like a, a Firefly-style story and, you know, the Mavericks really appear to them, or they like cyberpunk-style, you know, things in general. Or, exactly. Yeah, or the Earthers, or uh, we have quite a few people who I've found who really like the Quay, uh, which, you know, they're uh, they're anxiously waiting for a little bit more with uh, them and or the she still built. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm I'm uh, I'm eager to hear uh, you know what Grail Quest Books does uh, after this third round of of Phobos novellas comes out because uh, you know stuff after the Rift is uh, you know as if not less developed than. Uh, than the stuff during the Battle of Phobos. So, you know, to, to be able to continue to play in this in the sandbox would be would be a lot of fun, I think, for, for both the fans and for uh, the creators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, especially with, uh, as you just said, it, it really isn't as developed as uh, often people would assume it is. The, uh, with only 23 short stories and about, to, about the length of one regular novel if you compile it all together yeah well and and the what what amazes me like time and again like every time i i uh you know start having to research something for for the novella i'm i'm continuously blown away at uh how all this started with a card game and how you know the the factions really came about as a mechanic of the card game, where it's like okay, you need you know to build themed decks and you know and this that and the other, but it's so organically you know part of the storytelling that you really don't even notice anymore that that it started out with a card game, which you know makes for a lot easier storytelling. You know, it's it's not like you're you're having to remind people or having to try to not remind people, I guess that this was a card game because it's such a such a universe that flows so organically from one aspect to another that that it really is unified even though it's it's compartmentalized by factions. Absolute truth. I was just uh, talking to someone who one of my friends had been uh, showing some of the war short stories to, and when I was telling them a little bit more about it, they were like, wait, there's a card game too? Uh, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, the, it definitely has quite a few entry points. Yeah, well, hopefully we can get, you know, interested in the card game going again, and, uh, you know, hopefully Decipher will be able to start, you know, putting out some new material for us to uh, to play with on the tabletop, as it were. Fingers crossed, definitely. Exactly. Yeah. Um. Well, that's about gone through my list of questions here for you. Um, okay. Okay. Is there anything you would like to uh, talk about to our listeners that I haven't covered? Mm, I don't know. Um, you know, I would. No, I don't. I don't really think so. Nothing really comes to mind. So, I mean, that's the hard thing is that they're fans of wars already. So it's uh, you know, it's not like I have to do a lot of convincing for. Uh, <laughs> for them to be like, hey, go play this game you already play. <laughs> go read these stories you're already reading. Um, so, no, I, you know, I mean, just basically, uh, you know, if, if people can just, you know, keep telling their friends, it's, uh, you know, like I said, it's got something for everybody. And, uh, you know, every time I tell someone about the Wars universe and, and start talking about it, you know, it's really easy to get people interested. So, you know, to have that dialogue with your friends and, family and you know it's uh you know that's how the that's how you build a fan base so 
All right. And uh, I'd just like to finish off here then with a uh, very fanboy esque question. So okay. uh, I, I'm take it Gonjin are probably your favorite faction then. They are, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I don't even I don't even like relate to the Earthers at all. Like I don't even know they exist as except as enemies. So <laughs> to the Gonjin people. I, I I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> they uh, <laughs> when we were when we were talking uh, I, when we were developing the the arcs for each of these and uh, and then again I think fairly recently we were talking about this about how um, you know there aren't any bad guys like everyone's their own uh, you know their own heroes and their own stories and this that and the other but mm-hmm. you know you can say that but I I'm pretty sure the Earthers are just straight up bad across the board like I don't I don't know a good Earther so. <laughs> Oh, so, so so what makes Gonjin the uh, number one culture then? Um, <laughs> for uh, well, I mean, there's there's a couple of different ways to answer that. Um, you know, I think from the Gonjin perspective, uh, you know, they haven't been corrupted by by corporate interests, and uh, you know, their their philosophy of you know existing with the planet and with the universe, uh, I think you know, makes a lot of sense to, to them. And, uh, you know, and they can't understand why other people don't see things the same way. Uh, and I kind of get that. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't exactly get the, the whole corporate greed culture myself. So I have a hard time relating to the earth or existence in that same way. So, um, so yeah, I guess that's kind of both the inside and outside view, at least for me. <laughs> All right, I, I might cut this next part. I'm gonna say out, but um, okay. <laughs> okay so, what the that that's definitely something uh, I I have uh, thought about the same way with wars. Just personally, obviously, there's a uh, plenty of Earth fans out there. We want you to keep listening, but um, mm-hmm. <laughs> so in the uh, just the RPG game I've been running here at my campus, we ended up having a uh-huh. kind of meme of having Gonjin propaganda throughout the campaign we've been doing, uh, to the point uh-huh. where some art majors we had started making uh, propaganda posters. Oh, I would love to see those. <laughs> we, uh, we have one with a, a, the figure that constantly appears is Hoshi the Gear Girl, a Rosie the Riveter <laughs> ripoff. Um, and okay. th- there was a great one with, a, it was just full, like, smiling anime flowers with a, uh, Hoshi and like one of those stupid, uh, way too short anime schoolgirl clothes, and it's just uh-huh. Gonjin women are stronger than ever. Enlist today to fight the she and Earthers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, the ultimate thing with that actually came in game when the characters wanted to go to a movie, and uh-huh. Uh, we we just had them. Keep, they kept adding on to it, and uh, the movie ended up being like uh, the villain was a Earther capitalist who wore a monocle, and he got uh, <laughs> killed off at the end of the movie by getting crushed under the uh, the boarding ramp of his own starship as it was closing. <laughs> dropped his bag of money and was scrambling to get it, and couldn't decide whether living or getting his money was more important. <laughs> that is awesome. Uh, yeah, no, and I, I think that's actually an accurate portrayal of of Earther existence. So, uh, <laughs> uh, no, that's great. Um, that's very cool. Uh, sorry, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm I'm sure uh, I'm sure they have similar perceptions of, of the Gajan culture. Uh, you know, in the uh, in the Earther stories, so uh, you know, if they can't if they can't take a joke, then <laughs> what are you gonna do with them? Of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> there um there might be some Earther killing going on in, in Ganjin three too. Um, so uh, we'll have to see. I'll we'll keep a lookout for it. I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With their bags of money and, and top hats and monocles. <laughs> of course, because there's no other way to invade Gonjin. Yeah, exactly. Precisely. All their ships are shaped like 
top hats and monocles. So I never thought of that before. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, it did. I can see how Ganjin propaganda would have them flying in on the backs of or on upside down top hats with monocles. <laughs> yeah, look a little lull sack actually. <laughs> Dropping bags of money to the Ganjins to get them to defect. <laughs> Come to us. We live happy. Oh. It's uh, it's a great universe, you know, and that's one of the things. It's easy to get sucked in and and uh, you know just have fun with it because you know they did such a good job flushing it out that it does feel real for um, you know for what it is. So. All yeah. right. Well, it has definitely been a pleasure talking to you, Sean. Uh, we wish you luck on your uh, next novella adventure, and we'd like to thank you for having played around with wars and, you know, created some things which we really enjoyed reading here. Well, thanks for just, you know, helping spread the word, because wars is one of those properties that, that should be more appreciated than it is. All right. Thank you, and you've been listening to Wars Radio 2. to Wars Radio. I'm your host, James Wilder, and I'm here with a very special guest, Sean E. Williams. Say hello, Sean. Hello. <laughs> Alright, uh, Sean wrote uh, Wars, the Battle of Phobos, Gonjin 1, The Great Journey, and he's writing Gonjin 3 as well. Now, tell us a little about yourself before we get into the Wars aspect of all this. Uh, where, where do you want me to start? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, well, what what do you do with yourself when you're uh, not writing Wars novellas? Well, uh, I'm currently writing um, prose and uh, comic books. Uh, I think most significantly I'm working on the... Uh, see, there they go. Yeah. Um, let, me, let me go grab him and yeah. I can start over one second. Sorry about that. Right. Should we just start from the beginning again? <laughs> yeah, we probably should. <laughs> well, uh, back to uh, some tonal shift here once again. But um, we have a few reader questions here for you. Okay. Or uh, not? Re oh, wow, that was stupid. Reader questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Can you release the transcript too? Uh, uh, if I had the free time to do a transcript, that would be amazing. <laughs> uh, um, okay. <laughs> I have another set of bad news to add to the number of, uh, malfunctions. Okay. Uh, the call recorder wasn't working, but now it is working. Oh, no! <laughs> uh, okay. So we're starting from the beginning, then? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, hopefully we have a good connection now, so at least that'll work. Yeah, we we seem to, and uh, at least we'll we'll have a good blooper reel, if nothing else, to put after the closing credits. Oh, there you go. <laughs> 